Chapter 17, Externalities. Put our objectives up here real quick and let's move this over here to the side. Explain how externalities arise, why external costs bring market failure and overproduction, and how property rights and the public choices might achieve an efficient outcome. We're going to talk about the tragedy of commons and any possible solutions to this economic dilemma. Explain why external benefits bring market failure and underproduction and public choices might achieve an efficient outcome. We were just talking about an example of that in our opening comments. So an externality, a cost or benefit that arises from production and falls on someone other than the person or the firm choosing the action. A negative externality imposes a cost and a positive externality creates a benefit. But remember, there are two sides this externality discussion. And the four types of externalities are negative production externalities, positive production externalities, negative consumption externalities, and positive consumption externalities. Negative production externalities we say are common. Burning coal to gen generate electricity emits carbon dioxide. Logging and clearing forests destroy the habitat of wildlife and adds carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. All of these are negative production externalities. Noise from aircraft, trucks, pollution of rivers and lakes, and air pollution in major cities from auto exhaust. <clears throat> Positive production externalities are less common than negative. Two examples, honey and fruit production. All right, it's common practice locating honeybees next to a fruit orchard. Fruit growers get an external benefit from the bees by allowing the bees to pollinate the fruit crop. Negative consumption externalities are a common part of everyday life. Smoking tobacco in enclosed spaces poses health risk to others. Noisy parties or loud car stereos disturb others or cell phones ringing in class. Positive consumption externalities are also common. Getting a flu vaccine not only helps protect our own health, but helps protect the health of our neighbors, our communities. When the owner of a historic building restores it, everyone gets to see the building. Everyone gets pleasure from the building. All right, so let's talk about the distinction between three costs. All right, private, external, and social cost. A private cost of production is a cost that is borne by the producer of a good or service. Marginal private cost is the private cost of producing one more unit of service. Remember, you're looking at this term, marginal cost. And when we think of marginal cost, I want to think about one more unit. 
An external cost of production is a cost that is not only borne by the producer, but borne by some other people. Let's start thinking about external cost. So not only borne by myself, but outside by others. Marginal external cost. The cost of producing one more unit of a good or service that falls, and here's an important distinction, that falls on people other than the producer. Marginal social cost. The marginal cost incurred by society, by the producer and everyone else on whom the cost falls. Marginal social cost is the sum of marginal private cost and marginal external cost. So remember, marginal social cost is equal to marginal cost plus marginal external cost. We're gonna express this in dollars, but remember that the dollars represent the value of a foregone opportunity. And marginal private cost, marginal external cost, and marginal social cost increase with output. So as output grows, the marginal cost incurred by the entire society. We're speaking on this in terms of pollution. So go back to our prior example of burning of fossil fuels. Okay, burning of fossil fuels. What's the cost to society? The cost of environmental damage or damage to the person from that kind of yeah, what is the marginal social cost? Well, it would be the carbon dioxide that's being released into the atmosphere. And anyone around that area, if we're doing this all across the country, the entire American society is bearing this cost. Marginal private cost, marginal external cost, marginal social cost will increase with input. So as we increase output of burning of fossil fuels, we are going to increase the marginal social cost. So how can we put value on this? All right, so let's look at an example. Suppose there are two similar rivers, one polluted and the other clean with 10 identical riverside homes. The homes on the clean river rent for $2,000 a month, and those on the polluted river rent for $1,500 a month. If the pollution is the only detectable difference between the houses, then the rent difference of $500 is the pollution cost for each home. And when 10 homes on the side of a polluted river, the external cost of pollution is $5,000 a month, collectively the cost is $5,000 a month. So let's throw up a graph here. Here we're looking at the relationship between cost and output in a paint industry that pollutes a river. So what do we observe first? If we look at our marginal cost curve, what do we notice? We're getting cost produce. Cost increases as what increases? Quantity. Quantity. 
So we say here, this is the private cost of producing paint. It costs the producer $1 per gallon to produce 3 million gallons of paint. If a firm pollutes a river, it will impose an external cost. So here, let's look at this. When output is 3 million gallons of paint per month, the marginal private cost is $1, $1 per gallon. Marginal external cost, is 75 cents per gallon. So what's the marginal social cost? One seventy five. So the marginal cost is 175 per gallon. And we go back to marginal social cost is equal to marginal cost plus the marginal external cost. Now, the equilibrium, let's focus here. An unregulated market for paint, and the quantity of the paint produced is where marginal private cost equals marginal social benefit. And at the equilibrium, what do we notice here? Marginal social benefit is less than marginal social cost. Are we efficient? No. No, we are efficient when marginal social benefit is equal to marginal social cost. All right, so we said that we are inefficient and market equilibrium. So market equilibrium we said was at $1 per gallon and 3 million gallons of paint per month. Where is the efficient equilibrium? Dollar twenty-five and two million gallons of paint per month. So we can look at the dead weight loss area created right here in the gray triangle. All right, three approaches to overcome inefficiencies are to establish property rights, mandate clean technology, and tax or price pollution. What do we mean by establishing property rights? Ownership. Ownership. Be a little more specific for me. Property rights. Ownership, use, and disposal of factors of production and goods and services that are enforceable in court. Property rights, legally established titles to the ownership, use, and disposal of factors of production and goods and services that are enforceable in the courts. Why do we establish property rights? boundaries. So well, it's one way of allowing producers to recognize the costs that they are creating. Remember, established titles to the ownership, use, and disposal of factors of production, and it is enforceable in court, so property rights can confront producers with the cost of their actions, provide them with incentives to be more efficient, create incentives for them to pollute less, both in the creation and the disposal. 
All right, property rights have two possible responses. Use an abatement technology and produce less and pollute less. What's an abatement technology? A production technology that reduces or prevents pollution. A production technology that reduces or prevents pollution. And what producers will do is consider all alternative technologies and choose the one that is going to incur the least cost. An alternate to using abatement technology is to cut production and pollute less. By cutting pollution, the firm gets a higher income from renting homes on the river. Okay, polluting less, their income receipts are going to rise. So the decision turns on cost and the firm will choose the least cost alternative. So when looking at adopting any type of alternative technology, you would expect firms to compare this to any rise in rental income they might receive, and firms are going to adopt the alternative with the least cost. All right, let's look at another figure. All right, so figure 17.3, how property rights receive, achieve an efficient outcome. So here we see the producer of the good bears all the cost. So the marginal social cost curve includes, because they bear the cost, we're gonna say that it includes the cost of producing paint plus the abatement cost and any cost to pollution. So the supply curve here is going to be equal to marginal private cost is equal to marginal social cost. Now the market outcome is efficient because why? You have marginal social cost and marginal social benefit uh, creating equilibrium. Correct. And we say we have, they are at equilibrium because marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit. So if the producer bears the cost of pollution or abatement, here's what we can see. Market equilibrium is going to occur at $1.25 per gallon and at $1.25 dollar per gallon, we are at 2 million gallons of paint per month. And at that price, we are at equilibrium. All right, the Coast Theorem. A proposition that if property rights exist, only a small number of parties are involved and transaction costs are low and private transactions are efficient. No externalities because all parties take into account the externalities involved. The outcome is independent of who has the property rights. Remember, this will only work if transaction costs are low. Transaction cost, cost of conducting a transaction. An example, buying a home includes, remember this, fee for the agent, mortgage loan advisors, anyone else that you would pay in order to conclude that real estate transaction. 
And when a large number of people are involved in an externality and transaction costs are high, the system establishing property rights doesn't work and governments try to deal with the externality. And when transaction numbers are large and affecting more members of a society, we expect government to get involved. And what's one thing that governments can do? They can issue mandates. Regulation is the government's likely response. They can tax or cap price pollution. They can rely on taxes and cap and trade. Right now, taxes and regulation appear to dominate our news headlines today. So the government can set a tax equal to the marginal external cost. And the effect of such tax is to make marginal private cost plus the tax equal to marginal social cost. So the marginal private cost of, is going and add into the tax is going to equal the marginal social cost. And we're going to say this is the Pigovian tax. And we see we're going to give credit to a British economist. All right, figure 17.4. How the pollution tax equal to the marginal external cost can achieve an efficient outcome. All right, so remember, at the quantity of the good produced, marginal social cost is equal to marginal social benefit. So are we efficient? Yes. We are. And market equilibrium will occur at $1.25, and at $1.25, we have 2 million gallons of paint per month. And what are we gonna see? We can put up our dead weight loss. Oh, go back, go back. Right here in the purple triangle. Cap and trade. All right, let's talk about cap and trade. A cap is an upper limit. Each firm is set a pollution quota. I'm gonna say a very good example that you see in cap and trade involves the automotive industry. A government that uses this method must first estimate the efficient quantity of pollution and then set the overall cap equal to that quantity. In the efficient allocation of pollution quotas, each firm has the same marginal social cost. Each firm knows what is the maximum amount of pollution that they can create. And they know the cost of them because once they breach or exceed that cap, our government is imposed a cost to them and each firm knows what that cost is and the firm each firm is going to have the same cost so the government solves the allocation problem by making an initial distribution of the cap across firms and allowing them to trade it in a market for pollution permits and I know that sounds like what but the firm, the government sets a maximum amount that they can create, a maximum amount of pollution that they can create. This is going to encourage firms to come up with better technology, less polluting ways of creating an automobile. Obviously, they are going to compare the cost of adopting any new technology with the cost that they would incur by going over that cap. And let's just say that um, 
Toyota is leaning the initiative in uh, technology and reducing pollution. And let's say that, and I'm just including numbers here. I'm not trying to pick on any particular company or label them as a pollutant or give credit to anyone for being green. But let's just say that Chrysler Dodge is the, knows that they are going to go over. Okay, so in this case, if Toyota's got excess that they are not going to use, they can actually trade that over to Chrysler. Now, they're going to trade that at some cost, some cost to Chrysler. So this is an example. Firms with low abatement costs sell permits and make big cuts in per pollution. That's my example of Toyota. Firms with high abatement costs buy permits and make smaller cuts or no cuts in pollution. In that example, that would be my Chrysler Dodge. The market price of a permit confronts polluters with the marginal social cost and leads to an efficient outcome. All right, the United States has made its own air cleaner by adopting the measures you've just seen, but to solve the global warming problem, it's gonna require public choices at a global level. We can't do it alone here in the United States. Lower carbon dioxide concentration in the world's atmosphere is a global public good and like all public goods, it creates the free rider problem. Carbon reduction also faces carbon leakage tendency for non-participants in carbon reduction to increase emissions. So if we're making all of the efforts to reduce pollution, other countries, other folks not participating in our green initiatives can actually increase pollution. And what we have seen thus far, the only major attempt. Is anyone familiar with this? No. Anyone listening? Where I live, I could help you want to mention that because where I live, there's a lot of peace and power. And the uh, I think they changed something with the emissions or something with the diesel truck. And my boyfriend's uncle literally took the part off of his truck that is supposed to make his diesel truck more carbon friendly because he said it produced less power on his diesel truck. Did everyone hear that? No. Member of her boyfriend's family. We do have a lot of diesel trucks here, as you all have a lot of diesel equipment out in the Midwest as well, but a lot of diesel uh, trucks running the roads here and says that uh, that member of the family, we shall keep nameless right now, but removed a part from his diesel truck. This part was designed to cut emissions from the diesel, but he, with his knowledge of auto mechanics, says that it also cut power and I'm by power, I'm assuming horsepower or torque or yeah. some other measure. Who does that sound like? Rednecks? Well, not Rednecks, but there was a major automotive company that got into trouble for removing some parts on uh, their diesel lineup. Volkswagen. Parts that were designed to reduce carbon emissions. Volkswagen. Volkswagen, yes. <laughs> Billion dollar, billion dollar, if I'm not mistaken, $19 billion settlement. My mother-in-law got caught up in that, uh, I believe it was a few months ago. There was a deadline that they had to uh, turn in purchase vehicles. Now it, it was given as a credit system for a new vehicle. Uh, but I know that was a, a good bit of a headache at the time. Yes, and when we're talking about that, let's think of that example. You know, specifically think of, you know, I've often thought about the community of Chattanooga, Tennessee. 
Okay, that is where Volkswagen chose to base their North American operations years ago, not too many years ago, but they built a major automotive manufacturing plant down there. These cars coming off the assembly line, they could not be sold, they could not be distributed. They just sat there on the lot. Um, your automotive dealerships, if any of you are friends or family or acquaintances that own Volkswagen dealerships. Yes, you couldn't sell those cars. Nope, and then, um, unfortunately, like, um, if your car was not included in the in the buyback, your car depreciated so much because of the name association. Correct. Yes, so you still, the individual still bore the cost of depreciation, or the dealer. Yeah. Holding a brand new car sitting there. Yep. Most of these cars sitting out in the weather. Good examples, good examples of how these costs can, can rise, can get high. All right, so going back to what we were talking about. Uh, the United States, we said, participated with the international community in the carbon reduction program. The Kaido Protocol signed by 30 countries, not ratified by the U.S. or announced by Canada. British and Canada, Ireland, have introduced a carbon tax. Kind of looking at some other governments. Some governments, the United Kingdom included, have the equivalent of a partial carbon tax on gasoline. So without participating in large side participation, we see where individual countries and individual economies have tried to go in and take their own initiatives. All right, the tragedy of commons, another negative externality. Let me give you an example of the tragedy of commons. All right, I'll give you a quick history on this. Go all the way back to England, 16th century. Sheep became very popular. And the price of sheep had increased to such a point that more and more farmers demanded more and more land in order to grow sheep, raise sheep, livestock. And so they started taking land that was once reserved for public consumption and public enjoyment, and they put it in their own practice for raising sheep. And as they took more and more land away from the public, less and less land was used for other purposes. The whole countryside becomes, or we'll say the countryside becomes dominated for livestock, and of course, supply and demand is going to tell us that as more and more sheep were flooding the market, what do you think happened to the cost ultimately? It was driven down and all of a sudden England had invested heavily in sheep and all of a sudden the price corrects itself and the country faces economic downfall. So the tragedy of commons is the overuse of a common resources that a rider and its users have no incentive to conserve it and use it in a sustainable way. Current examples include overfishing of the Atlantic Ocean cod. All right, if you want to look for a more modern example, again, look at the North American cod here in the United States throughout the 1950s and 60s. There was no incentive to curb um, fishing, and the price of cod was very lucrative at that time. It was not as common, and as opportunity created it, no barriers to entry. More and more fishermen got involved in the trade, and you can imagine what happened. Other examples include fishing of the yellowfin tuna in the South Pacific wells. And what other resources? We talked about fishing, we talked about livestock. What other resources do you think 
probably more prevalent today in modern times. Some common resources. I'm thinking of natural waterways. Waterways. Let's just say natural resources. Let's lump them all. All right, so many common resources. Let's think of, when we talk about a renewable resource, all right, if I, cut, if I label a resource as renewable, what are some characteristics that it's gonna possess? I would have the ability to replenish itself over time. Replenish themselves over time, birth and growth of new members. We're going to keep the population growing, or at least the population sustainable. All right, a common resource is being used unsustainably. If its rate decreases, its stock. So one is sustainable if we're able to replenish, if we use it in a way that replenishes itself and maintains or grows the population. We say that we are unsustainable and using it unsustainably if our use actually decreases the amount of stock that we have. All right, so let me hear your input. How do taxes, pollution charges, cap and trade work reduce emissions? And do they work? In, do they reduce emissions? Brian, what's your thoughts? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Charles? You always got a good answer. All right, how do taxes, pollution charges, and cap and trade work to reduce emissions? First, I ask, do they work to reduce emissions? I believe they can provide an incentive to producers or firms to change or modify their behavior to a more acceptable way. And as firms are offered these incentives, if given a choice, what will they compare it to? The opportunity costs. Good answer. I was just gonna say cost. But opportunity costs, you are correct. And what's the chief objective of this organization? To, ma to maximize profits. And if we say and we charge firms with the objective to maximize profits, they are going to choose, if given a choice, they are going to choose the least costly alternative. All right, let's look at a graphical example of the tragedy of the commons and then we will break. So we will be bringing up 17.5. All right, figure 17.5 is going to illustrate the sustainable catch curve, and we will say this is the SCC. To you sports fans, I did not say the SEC. To your investment advisors, not the SEC, the SCC, sustainable catch curve. As the stock of fish increases, 
the sustainable catch increases up to a maximum. And we can see at the top of this graph that our maximum catch is 300,000 tons per year. As the stock increases further, here's what's gonna happen. The fish must compete for food and the sustainable catch falls. So remember, we could argue we are using this stock in a sustainable way up to 300,000 pounds per year, 300,000 tons per year. But as we continue to fish, we see that we are going to decline. So anything less than at point A, the stock is going to shrink. And we say anything to the right, the stock is going to decrease. So fish stock increases up to a maximum. I'm going to paraphrase. And as the stock increases further, remember, fish are going to have to compete these animals you know less is going to be there to support they're going to compete for food and the sustainable catch is going to fall we see that along the scc curve and if the catch exceeds the sustainable catch fish will continue to diminish if the catch is less than a sustainable catch stock will grow All right, figure 17, six. <laughs> Who's eating the chips? Me. All right, it's broadcasting loud on the speakers here. Oh, my bad. <laughs> oh, I just want to. <laughs> All right, so figure 17.6. Why does overfishing occur? All right, so we look back at this other example and we interpreted this. And at what point did we reach unsustainability or start the trend toward unsustainability? So now we're going to ask, why does overfishing, why would it still occur? Well, it's going to occur unless there is an incentive not to. All right, unless there's an incentive not to. All right, so let's look at an example. The supply is the marginal private cost curve MC. The demand is the marginal social benefit curve. MSB. And we would say equilibrium is at the intersection of these two lines. And so equilibrium is going to occur at 800,000 tons per year and $10 a pound. Now the marginal social cost curve. Here we're going to draw this in the yellow line. And according to the marginal social cost curve, we see the efficient quantity is 300,000 tons per year. So at the market equilibrium, there is overfishing and a dead weight loss would arise. And by how much are we? overfishing.
All right, it is harder. Let's wrap this up. It is harder to achieve an efficient outcome in the use of a common resource other than to define the conditions in which it can occur. So you are right, Brian. We are not going to work to toward that efficiency unless we are given the incentive. And it's going to be up to someone or some power to set that condition. And the three main methods used to achieve the efficient use of a common resource are property rights, production quotas, and individual transferable quotas. And we will abbreviate that ITQs, but individual transferable quotas. And property rights. So if we could convert the common resources to private property, fishers face the full social cost of their actions. And the marginal social cost curve would also become the supply curve. And the resource here would be used efficiently. But when I set a production quota, the total efficient quantity might be used efficiently. So again, we're going to say that we're marginal supply cost is equal to marginal supply curve, or excuse me, marginal supply benefit. 300,000 tons per year at a price of $15 per pound. That is where we are efficient. Now, a fisher who cheats will increase his profit, so there is an incentive to overfish. And we see that since there is a profit to be made, the incentive is going to be there to overfish and capture that profit. Because the quota is less than what the supply is dictating. So remember, if quotas are set below where market supply dictates and shows us, if quotas are set are below, we're going to encourage, or at least we are going to offer incentives to cheat. If profit is still there on the table, we're still going to offer an incentive for someone to cheat. Individual transferable quotas. We set a production limit that is assigned to an individual who is free to transfer the quota to someone else. And when they're free to transfer that quota, a market is going to emerge and the efficient quantity of ITQs is assigned. The market price of an ITQ confronts resources users with a marginal cost equal to marginal cost plus the price of the ITQ. So we would say that marginal cost plus the price of an ITQ is equal to the marginal social benefit. And in figure 17.7, shows the situation with an efficient number of ITQs. All right, marginal social cost, we said was equal to the marginal cost <coughs> of the ETQ. And if fishers make the marginal social benefit equal marginal social cost, the outcome is efficient. Only thing we're introducing here is how are we defining the marginal social cost? Well, remember, it's the marginal cost plus the price of the ETQ. Now, ITQs are used on a scale that keeps output at the efficient level. And let's get back here. 
The market price of an ITQ is equal to the marginal social benefit minus marginal social cost. And because each user of the common resources faces the opportunity cost of using the resource, self-interest achieves the social interest. So there is a self-interest here. Now, speaking of these tragedy of commons, give me another example that comes to mind, and let's try to relate this to something within our own home states. I do believe we have three states represented here. Indiana. What's an example of the tragedy of commons that we might observe here in the state of Indiana? And I'm putting Indiana on the spot, so Kansas, Wisconsin, you in Wisconsin, you can debate, come up with an example. If you one comes to mind, go ahead and speak up while Indiana thinks of an example. I can't think of anything necessarily like for Indiana that we overuse because I don't really know. I'm, I'm bad. I don't know really what our resources are that we output here. But the one like example that I could think of is just like mm -hmm. haven't honeybees been like an issue? We're using a, like we've been using a lot of honey. Can't keep up, and all the price of honey's went up really, really high lately. That's the only thing I can think of. We're using an example of honeybees here in Indiana, and I would agree with that. Okay? An example that I think about in Kentucky, um, coal production. Wisconsin, Kansas, what do you got? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that we're very close to Lake Michigan. Like wastewater being thrown into Lake Michigan from Milwaukee and it's filtered down to Chicago. Okay. Is there any anything farmed out of Lake Michigan? Is there what? Is there anything farmed out of Lake Michigan that maybe surrounding communities there have overused? Fish. <laughs> Good answer. How about you, Kansas? I'm trying to think of some and I'm like going blank. I'm not. I can't think of anything that is in overuse. Is Kansas where the Dust Bowl happened? Was that part of the area with the Dust Bowl? Where the what? The Dust Bowl, like way back in the day when everything was over farmed and had the Dust Bowl. I didn't know if Kansas was part of that or not. I honestly couldn't tell you anything in Kansas. I'm thinking of a famous phrase right now. All right, how can we help? What do we know about Kansas? Toto was not in it anymore. Toto was not in it. Kansas, I'm sure we could do a research. We'd come back to something involving farming. Um, I would probably say in all of our respective states, we could go back and look at something within the farming community. All right, let's talk now, rather than negative, let's look at positive externalities with a focus on education. <clears throat> and think, why are you here tonight? Knowledge comes from education and research and both bring external benefits. 
A private benefit, a benefit that the consumer of a good or service receives. So the marginal private benefit is the private benefit from consuming one more unit of a good or service. An external benefit is a benefit that someone other than the consumer receives. And we say that education delivers both private and external benefits. Marginal social benefit is the sum of marginal private benefit and marginal external benefit. And let's look at figure 17A. And illustrate, illustrate the marginal private benefit and marginal social benefit. The marginal external benefit is shown by the vertical distance between the marginal benefit and the marginal social benefit curves. <clears throat> well, let's get here. Go back to this graph. All right. What's happening at 15 million students? If 15 million students attend college, what do we get? Social marginal social benefit. The marginal social benefit is equal to what? Well, I'm asking for a quantity. 15. When 15 million students attend college, the marginal private benefit is equal to what dollar amount? 25,000. The marginal private. The marginal private is 10. You just miss listen to my question. So when 15 million students attend college, the marginal private benefit is $10,000 per student. Now, how can a private market underproduce an item that generates an external benefit? And here we've got a market demand curve. Our market demand curve is the marginal private benefit curve. D equals MB. So this curve right here. The supply curve is the marginal social cost curve. And it's right here. So this is going to represent our supply curve. This is going to represent the demand curve. Market equilibrium at a tuition of $15,000 a year and 7.5 million students. Is it efficient or inefficient? That's inefficient at 15,000. It's inefficient, correct. Marginal social benefit exceeds the marginal social cost. The inefficient quantity, Brian just told us, 15 million students. So we would have a dead weight loss shown here in this gray triangle. Now we're going to get government action in here. So figure 1710 is going to illustrate an efficient outcome. Buyers are going to pay the market price and taxpayers must pay the rest of the marginal social cost. 
So here, the efficient number of college students is 15 million students per year. This is at the point, remember, where marginal social benefit is equal to marginal social cost. With the demand and marginal private benefit curve, look at our demand curve. The price at which the efficient number, so at 15 million, $10,000 per year. If students pay that price, we leave it to the taxpayers to pay the remainder. And the remainder is equal to the marginal external benefit at the efficient quantity. So the marginal, the difference would be the 15. We're illustrating what we just said. And three devices that the government can use to achieve a more efficient allocation of resources in the presence of external benefits are public provisions, private subsidies, and vouchers. All right, under public production, a public authority that receives a payment for the government produces the good or service. So here we look. And if we want to introduce a private subsidy, a payment by the government to private producers. If the government pays the producer an amount equal to the marginal external benefit, the quantity produced will be efficient. Vouchers, a token that the government provides to households, which they can use to buy specific goods or services. And this would show how vouchers worth $15,000 per student could achieve an efficient outcome. Now, let's have some debate. Are public provisions, subsidized private provisions, and vouchers equivalent? Say no. No. And it's because we have to introduce the element of human behavior in each one of these. Both of the one receiving or entitled to, and remember our last week's discussion, bureaucrats, politicians. We got to ensure that all are going to make rational choices. And I don't think that all are collectively going to make rational choices. Therefore, we would have failure. <clears throat> All right, problems with public production. Public production might lead to underproduction. As bureaucrats and politicians seek to maximize their budget by budget padding and waste. All right, maybe again, look at your own state politicians here. Up to a federal level, think of any bureaucrats that you have. But public production could lead underproduction as bureaucrats seek to maximize their budget. Remember, politicians right now like to show, just like companies do, especially right now following the recession, fiscal responsibility, movements of the Tea Party. We want to show fiscally conservative, fiscally growing economic models on each state. And we might underproduce as a means of increasing positive results. Problems with private subsidies. Subsidies have to be administered by government and they might blow out the cost of administration and cut the size of the subsidy. And when you introduce a subsidy, you've got to have the team involved to administer that subsidy. That comes at a cost. And a lot of times, 
that subsidy, the cost incurred for running that subsidy can outpace the value of the subsidy itself. Producers receiving the subsidy might allocate some of it to lobbying for a larger subsidy and less to production. Now think about government gives a subsidy to a firm. How can they ensure that the firm uses that subsidy toward its intended use? All right, so no, we're going to say that these actions are all going to lead to an efficient outcome. Isn't that part of the issue that they had with, um, who was it? They went and they met and they said they needed help out of debt, but all the people that were like CEOs and stuff flew in on different private jets and they were asking for money from the government to help build them out. Who was that? Was that BP or I feel like it was like a it was a couple of years ago. It was like a big ordeal. The judge like threw a fit and was like, I'm not giving you anything because you guys didn't claim to be, you know, needing this money to that's sparking a bell from the automotive industry. Yeah, something I feel like it was gas or automotive or something. I can't remember what it was, but does that sound familiar to you all? Yes. For the automotive bell out. How they all went to Washington and they all rolled. Were they asking for some subsidy? They were asking for government bail. They want to file bankruptcy. Maybe that one, yeah. Four or was it the other one? I don't know. They went to the meeting, but they changed their mind last minute. I'm like, get out of this on our own. Correct. It's Chrysler and. And in our local economy, where we have two big Ford, Ford manufacturing plants, you can bet they let us know what they chose to do. All right, vouchers. Vouchers have four advantages over public provisions and private subsidies. Vouchers can be used with a public production. They can be used with private provisions or competition between the two. Governments get to set the total value of the vouchers to overcome any bureaucratic overproduction. And vouchers spread the public contribution thinly across millions of consumers, so no one has an interest in wasting the value of the voucher. By growing the buying power of the final consumer, producers must compete. And I'm going to say, as economists, this is our general thought, is that vouchers are the preferred method because vouchers are given to the individuals. Those individuals, because individuals are receiving these vouchers, the buying power is put in the recipient's hands. And firms must still compete on price and some other factor in order to attract the individual to come and spend that voucher. Make sense? <coughs> Any questions? Uh, Charles, I have a question. For a subsidy program, would that be the equivalent to subsidizing the consumption side? Subsidizing the production side. What, for, a, for a direct voucher to an individual that would be a consumer, would that still be the production side? Well, no, you're, if you're giving that voucher, remember in this case, we're giving the voucher to the consumer. Okay. You're given the subsidy to an individual, or excuse me, you're given the subsidy to a firm. The intended result would be it would, they would be able to lower the price of that item or at least produce more of that item, even if they, without the subsidy, would incur a loss. But you're given the firm a subsidy in order to maintain a certain production level. Okay. And remember the vouchers though, you're given directly to the consumers and therefore you're putting the buying power in the consumer's hands. And we get to follow the rules of normal market competition in order to compete for the spending of those voucher dollars. Okay. 